Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our book talk, Georgian and Soviet. Soviet Georgia received the same nation-building template as other national republics of the USSR. Uh, Stalin's Georgian heritage, however, um, allowed for personal involvement in local affairs as he ascended to the prominence of the head of the Soviet Union. Today, Georgia still grapples with the legacies of the Soviet century and the Stalin factor as well. Before we begin, a few remarks, opening remarks. Uh, we're very pleased that uh, Claire Kaiser is here this afternoon to discuss her new book. Um, I also encourage everyone to stay up to date with the latest Kennan Institute events and publications by visiting our website and subscribing to our blogs, Focus Ukraine and the Russia File, as well as our new Russian language blog, In Other Words. Uh, you can subscribe to other our podcasts, Canon X and The Russian File as well. Also visit our Hindsight Upfront collection uh, dealing with events in Ukraine. For those of you watching today, today's presentation, who would like to purchase a copy of the book, uh, we do have a, um, a discount. Uh, it is located outside the uh, uh, conference room. But the code is O nine capital B C A R D for a thirty percent discount. Uh, and finally, to our virtual audience, if you have any questions for the speaker, please submit them via email to Kenan at WilsonCenter.org, via Twitter at Kenan Institute, or on our Facebook page at any time. Please include your name and affiliation. Well, it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Claire Kaiser here. She is an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies, and head of uh, strategy for McClarty's Associate, a Washington-based global strategy firm. She also earned her PhD in modern Russian and Soviet history at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as an MA in Eurasian. MA in Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies, and a BS in Foreign Service from Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. Uh, with that, Claire, the floor is yours. Thank you, Will, and, and thanks very much to the Kennedy Institute and for the Wilson Center for, for hosting me here today. Um, I'm planning to probably give a 20, 25 minute or so overview of the book, and then we can get, get into discussion with Claire. That, 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 sounds, sounds, like a that sounds great. Great. All right. So, uh, bore some stark similarities to this event and important differences, of course, as well to this pivotal moment almost 70 years ago. So on this March 9th, uh, between March 5th and March 9th, tens of thousands of demonstrators took to the streets of Tbilisi as well as other cities in the Georgian SSR uh, against what they perceived to be uh, a slight by Khrushchev during the secret speech a couple of weeks earlier. Um, of course, this was, in theory, a secret speech, so it's not like anyone had seen the text. But as rumors started to spread in the aftermath of those, those um, you know, gigantic revelations uh, in February in Moscow, uh, a couple of key points started to get back to, um, to audiences in Georgia, namely that not only had Khrushchev thrown, on, thrown Stalin under the bus, so to speak, for um, any number of crimes, but that he said some things about him uh, in particular that uh, denigrated him as a Georgian national figure. Needless to say, this did not sit well with, uh, with Georgians in Georgia, Stalin's homeland. So Georgians gathered on March 5th, the anniversary of Stalin's death. He had died three years prior, um, as they had for the past couple of years, um, rallying at Stalin monuments, et cetera, singing songs, reciting poetry, bringing wreaths, et cetera. Um, pretty typical you know, funeral, funeral commemorations. But that evolved very quickly into uh, an escalating series of demands, uh, which were not really centrally coordinated at all. Uh, and it became a quite chaotic and um, honestly um, you know, unprecedented situ situation on the streets, such that uh, on the, the, just after midnight on March 9th, uh, someone gave the order for, for Soviet troops to fire on the demonstrators. Uh, and it killed a couple of dozen people, um, injuring uh, several dozen more primarily um, you know, teenagers and, and uh, including some, some women as well. 
So needless to say, uh, this is a crucial moment, not just in Georgian history, but also, I argue, in the history of the Soviet Union, in the Cold War, et cetera, but it isn't really on our mental map of, of that momentous year, um, which of course has, has uh, several significant events from the secret speech to uprisings and, and subsequent crackdowns in, in Hungary, Suez crisis, et cetera. Um, this is not really on that map, but, but is uh, you know, extremely important, uh, as, as my book argues. Uh, and this, uh, as, uh, for the, the reasons that I opened with it, also really the, the key turning point in my book. So I have a whole chapter devoted to these demonstrations, crackdown, and, and kind of subsequent um, efforts to mitigate the, the fallout, um, and, and that's chapter four in the book. Um, but as you'll see in this, this opening slide, um, there is a, a tiny memorial plaque uh, on the main thoroughfare in downtown Tbilisi devoted to these events. Um, you would miss it unless you were looking for it explicitly, uh, as I did um, the first time I went to Tbilisi. And it simply says, um, you know, in Georgian and in English, this monument commemorates the participants of a peaceful rally gunned down by the Soviet regime on March 9, 1956. Factually accurate, however, leaving out some pretty important elements of why they were on the streets in the first place, etc. Um, and this monument was put up uh, during the, the period when Mikhail Saakashvili was president. Um, so I think that gets at uh, not only the importance of this moment in, in Soviet Georgian history, but also the controversy, I think, that continues to, to swell around this, this date, um, as well as Stalin's role uh, and the, the specter of Stalin, perhaps, in the broader discourse of, of um, Georgian nationhood uh, as it relates to the Soviet period. So this is the, the focal point of my book, Georgian and Soviet, which came out about two months ago with Cornell University Press. And some of the key questions that I tackle in the book are, you know, first and foremost, what it meant to be Georgian and Soviet. And in this case, the and is actually doing quite a bit of analytical work. Uh, I think um, the sort of um, post-Soviet discourse uh, in, in Georgia and in many other um, uh, post-Soviet republic or post-Soviet countries has really focused on, you know, the dissident narrative, the opposition of um, you know, nation making and, and, uh, and nationalism to uh, broader Soviet forces. Uh, I'm trying to look at, you know, quite a different phenomenon and that is how the Soviet institutional um, structure of nation building, and there was an extremely, uh, extremely deep uh, resource uh, effort devoted to this, um, how Georgians, you know, first of all understood that institutional framework uh, to construct Georgian nationhood, but then how they leverage that, built upon it, et cetera, over the course of the 70 years of the Soviet experiment. So again, focused on this and. And then uh, secondarily, looking at how that process intersects with uh, Stalin as the you know, most, most famous uh, Georgian um, uh, person who had a very complicated relationship with his homeland at the same time. Uh, and then so his, his rise uh, and that of his network, as well as his subsequent fall, and the rather uneven process of destalinization as it took place in Georgia compared to elsewhere in, in the, the Soviet Union. Uh, and then finally, uh, I think the, a broader effort in the book, uh, and this is something that I started more than 10 years ago, but I think has uh, a bit more you know, urgency and insignificance, I hope, given the, the war in Ukraine, is what it looks like to kind of shift the vantage point of, of these kind of grand narratives of Soviet history uh, outside of the, the, the Moscow um, presumed master narrative. How does the story change when leading with voices from Georgia? Um, often in Georgian, but not exclusively in Georgian. Uh, and so that's, I think, a broader, um, what I hope to be analytical contribution of the book. So as I said, the Stalin factor uh, is, is a key narrative thread and, and hook uh, for this book. Uh, and one of the reasons why I think I initially pursued this project to begin with. Um, the Soviet literature on nationality policy is, is vast and uh, you know, deepening by the day. Um, but for me, uh, one of the, the big questions as I was you know, looking at uh, potential research projects back as a, as a humble grad student was you know, trying to reconcile on the one hand, um, you know, the, this individual who hailed from you know, a very um, you know, poor peasant family in, in, uh, in Gori, Georgia, uh, who rises to not just the, the apex of, of Soviet power, but really of global power um, at the end of World War II, uh, one might say. But what impact um, his life, his worldview, and his understanding of Georgian nationhood had on his homeland? And that was something that I felt like the existing scholarship to date hadn't really addressed. There are you know, 
uh, numerous, extremely detailed biographies of Stalin himself. Uh, I'm not trying to do that. Uh, that I think, um, you know, I, I would refer you to, to Stephen Kotkin and Ron Suni and um, Oleg Klevniuk's um, excellent works on, on um, Stalin's life. Uh, but this is more on the, the Stalin cult, the Stalin network, and what the, the unraveling of that over subsequent uh, generations uh, looks like from the perspective of, of Georgia proper. And so, uh, as I said, this is a, a key narrative of change over time, uh, first and foremost, of Stalin the individual. Uh, yes, he was uh, born in, in Georgia, in Gori, um, and had many different, I guess, public and, and private identities over the course of his life, from being a you know, young seminary student uh, as a teenager, where he embraced some of the early um, ideas of Georgian nationalism propagated by people, you know, Georgians now consider to kind of be their, um, you know, fathers of the nation, so to speak, writing nationalistic poetry and, and some of their, their publications, to then, of course, embracing Marxism and then Bolshevism, uh, really trying to publicly discard his, his Georgian national past, so to speak, even if that was a fairly brief, um, brief window in his youth, uh, for something that looked a lot more supranational, much more Russianized, um, and, and aimed to speak to a much broader audience. Um, of course, this does not uh, mean that he ever spoke Russian without a Georgian accent, that he ever discarded some of the kind of cultural aspects of Georgianness or Caucasianness that he took with him to Moscow. Uh, and of course, um, he also continued to surround himself, you know, up to the very end of his life with, with people who either were from the Caucasus, from Georgia, or who built their career in the Caucasus. So he had this, this deeply rooted network that went with him to Moscow as he, as he rose in the ranks. And so uh, we have this, this kind of complicated picture of Stalin uh, who is changing his own relationship with Georgia over time over the course of his life, uh, as well as a different kind of public versus private persona that he's cultivating uh, you know, during, during his lifetime. We also then have the construction of what Khrushchev you know, kind of coins, the, the Stalin cult, um, that uh, becomes such a problematic issue from 1956 and thereafter. Um, but again, here, this is where Georgia has a bit of a different story to tell. Um, of course, from Moscow's perspective, there was a, a, a highly constructed, very clearly defined cult of Stalin uh, that, that um, you know, official Soviet organs at the highest uh, echelons were promoting very, very actively um, globally, but, but as well as in the Soviet Union. But you had, on the Georgian side, a more grassroots, I think less, less controlled um, national variant of that Stalin cult that proved much more difficult to undo uh, with, you know, simply a, a stroke of a, of a pen uh, in the secret speech. And honestly, that process, I think, is still, still ongoing in a number of ways. Uh, we see in Stalin as well, um, on the one hand, uh, someone who <clears throat> tries to discard some aspects of his relationship with Georgia uh, over the course of his life as he, as he rises to power in Moscow, but a continued... Um, if inconsistent uh, desire to almost micromanage certain elements of the, the development of a national canon, national culture, et cetera, in Georgia, whether it was through the cult of um, promoting the cult of Rustavelli, kind of Georgia's Pushkin, so to speak, though he predated Pushkin by several centuries, um, whether it was in uh, line editing, uh, line editing film scripts about Georgi Sakadze and Georgian history at the height of World War II or again, line editing uh, textbooks on the history of Georgia. These were things that he probably didn't need to do. He was probably rather busy, you know, in the, the late 30s and, and in the 40s, um, given uh, the, the height of his power, uh, yet he still felt, um, you know, some sort of compulsion to, to weigh in in, in a, an extremely detailed matter on these issues of, of Georgian nation, nation building at a more, um, you know, micro level. And then I think this is kind of the key, key point of departure for my book is what happens then in this period, I label it as between Stalin and Shepard Nabze, or the period when you know, Stalin dies in 1953, Beria similarly uh, you know, disappears from the scene in 1953 as he's arrested and executed, being you know, Stalin's kind of key um, implementer, so to speak, uh, for, for much of his life. Um, and then you have really a gap between 1953 slash six and 1985 when Edward Shevardnadze uh, rises again to be foreign minister of the Soviet Union, uh, kind of at, at Gorbachev's uh, right hand uh, side. So there's a, a, an important gap of a few decades there where Georgians did not perceive that they had a, a patron in Moscow, so to speak, from, from, uh, from Georgia, 
But it was precisely in this period when you see, I think, the extent of what Soviet nation building policies in Georgia produced and the uh, reins with which local actors were able to sort of use that, you know, to promote their own, their own agendas. And, and so that's really the, the kind of key focus of, of the book is that Stalin to Shevardnadze window. Um, so a key you know, methodological intervention that I'm trying to make in the book as well is, is introducing a different terminology for how we think of the Soviet Union as an empire, how it managed ethno-national diversity. Um, for me, this was always the most um, interesting and most, um, I don't know, remarkable uh, element, not just of Soviet history, but of, you know, big picture Russian imperial history as well, is the extent to which this, this vast polity, this complicated straight structure could manage the, the enormous ethnic diversity within it. Um, but I have found that in the uh, academic literature, in particular on Soviet um, nationality policy, the, the way that they were describing populations in non-Russian republics, Georgians in Georgia, Armenians in Armenia, et cetera, would refer to those groups as titular nationalities. And I, was, I never really liked that term. Um, first of all, it was very isolating. I felt like scholars of Soviet nationality policy knew what it meant, but few others really did. <laughs> you know, so it was somewhat limiting in terms of, of describing what it was actually you know, intending to, to describe. Uh, but more importantly, I felt like it was very passive. Um, you know, it wasn't doing a whole lot of analytical work in describing, uh, in describing those groups. And I didn't feel like it reflected you know, the, the, the Georgians and, and other um, citizens residing in the Georgian SSR that I was encountering in the archives. And so I am referring to Georgians in the Georgian SSR, Armenians in the Armenian SSR, Ukrainians, et cetera, et cetera in their own republics as entitled nationalities as opposed to titular nationalities. And so what I'm trying to do with this term is first and foremost to make it a bit more active, you know, not passive. And so it's, it's showing these individuals trying to embrace not just the statistical and legal implications of living in one's own territory uh, and trying to first and foremost understand what the special rights and privileges that the Soviet nationality regime built for them, but then also trying to actively claim them over time. And this is something that I think is a bit different, but something that you know I did very much sort of um, conclude as a result of my my um, deep archival research. Um, you know, looking at a variety of types of sources, not just official ones. I did a lot of work with you know petitions and letters and that sort of thing. You know, precisely getting at the the types of Soviet citizens who wanted to engage with the state on their own terms, but also try to demand more of it, um, which is a fascinating genre I think in in Soviet history generally. And so. Um, again, this is not something that just existed on paper, though it did exist on paper. This is also a process of these, these citizens trying to claim these rights in practice. Uh, and these were not rights that were equal. This was a way to make, in the case of Georgia, Georgians in Georgia have more rights than other nationalities in the Republic. That was by design. This was not unique to Georgia, but the case study that I'm looking at is Georgia, which is why I, I focus on that um, in particular. And so uh, this is something that also changes over time with the Stalin of divide, um, where you see in the Stalin period, um, individuals much more kind of in the elite sphere trying to make claims on these entitled rights um, due to their proximity, perceived or real, to Stalin, uh, playing up the, the um, you know, uh, almost trying to pull at the heartstrings of their co-ethnic in Moscow, be it Stalin or Beria or whoever, um, you know, not necessarily to good effect, but that didn't mean they didn't try. Um, and other, other elites in Georgia trying to, you know, drive these processes, but, but again, much more from a, an elite and policy perspective. You see then, after 1956, a much more, I think, grassroots popular process where it isn't just about the, the elite, the, the intelligentsia, the writers' union, but it is a much more broader-based um, process that isn't necessarily limited to Tbilisi. And you see that at a couple different moments. Um, I look at three different um, popular mobilizations uh, in the book, 1956, one in 1978 about language rights, and then another in 1989 related to Abkhazia and, and subsequently independence. And so you, know, you see this more almost like civic uh, and grassroots effort um, happening over the course of those, those three moments. And then, of course, uh, just as you have uh, these entitled uh, nations trying to uh, make the Soviet Union, you know, recognize rights uh, as they uh, 
as they were promised in the Soviet constitution and elsewhere, uh, that of course then has important implications for non-entitled populations in the Republic. And in Georgia, you know, there's a lot of um, peculiarities in this regard. You have um, significant minority populations of Armenians, Azerbaijanis, and Russians, um, uh, Greeks, Turks, uh, Iranians at various points, uh, and I have a chapter devoted to um, post-war ethnic deportations that looks at a lot of those groups um, you know, in, in greater detail. But you also, of course, have the problem of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, where um, in the case of Abkhazia, um, you know, they have uh, the status of an autonomous republic within Georgia. They have an entitled population on paper, the Abkhaz, but they never had anywhere close to a majority population uh, by nationality in the republic. And so um, that, I think, is another one of the, the broader narrative th threads that runs throughout the book is the relationship between Sukhumi, the capital of Abkhazia, and Tbilisi, and the extent to which the Abkhaz are trying and failing to get Moscow to sort of act as an intermediary um, to, to make good on their um, entitled rights as they understood them on paper. Um, but of course, that has crucial implications uh, by, the, by the late 80s. So just to run through very quickly um, some of the key events and developments uh, the book touches on, um, it, you know, I, I focused mostly on 1945 to 1989, but cover a lot of different, um, you know, lenses, I guess, within that. Um, and I think this shows also the, the breadth and depth of, of how Georgians were trying to experiment with uh, this, um, you know, architecture of Soviet nation making uh, that they were, that they were given uh, starting from the 20s. So, First and foremost, uh, a series of territorial irredentist campaigns uh, starting from the, the early Cold War period. This is vis-a-vis -vis Azerbaijan, Turkey, and Iran, uh, and continues into the 1960s and 70s as well. Uh, I mentioned the internal resettlements and deportations and expulsions. This is not something happening in the 30s. This is happening from 1944 through 1951, uh, which is a much later timeline than I think most people tend to, to think of these types of, of operations, that they were happening in pretty significant numbers uh, in Georgia and the Caucasus in that post-war period. Uh, these demonstrations and, and responses uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know, popular mobilization uh, around key issues of national importance in 1956, 1950s, or 1977 and 78, around the, the period of the Brezhnev Constitution, language rights, as well as Abkhazia, uh, and then again in 1989. And, and these were occurring really throughout the Republic. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, looking at Georgia as the real capital of the Soviet second economy. Um, and this is a, an important outgrowth of uh, the Kind of post-1956 compromise, so to speak, that, uh, that Georgia's leadership made with Moscow in the aftermath of these um, violent demonstrations. Uh, and then uh, inter-ethnic relations as well as the growth and Georgification of Tbilisi over this period. Um, Tbilisi, again, uh, extremely old city, uh, has, a, has a very, very long and fascinating history. But in its modern iteration, it only achieved a majority Georgian uh, population by nationality in the early 1970s. And so I, I kind of chart how and why that happened when it did, uh, and how that kind of maybe runs up against uh, the, the stories that, that many are telling about the history of Tbilisi. And so just to, to conclude here and open up a bit to discussion, uh, Stalin's ghosts are alive and well in Georgia today, uh, something that I think Anyone who visits uh, can get a feel for as they're walking the streets of Tbilisi, as they're going to the Dry Bridge Market, as they are, um, you know, just engaging in, in popular discourse, visiting the Stalin Museum in Gori. Um, you know, in spite of official efforts to erase Stalin from the public um, space, uh, that doesn't mean that in uh, in individual and private ways uh, he has been uh, eliminated. And I have this uh, fascinating piece of graffiti that I actually, um, I took this, I think, in 2013. So it was uh, almost 10 years ago at this point, but uh, not long after the Georgian Dream government was first elected. Uh, they were elected in October of 2012. And so you have these three, you know, Soviet nesting dolls, I guess, where Stalin is the, the big one, Putin's the middle one, and Bidzina Ivanishvili is the smallest one, uh, Ivanishvili being the, uh, the founder of the Georgian Dream Party, uh, initial prime minister, and now just person behind the scenes, uh, generally understood to be uh, running the show in Georgia. And so I think um, this, this image probably has even more significance now than it did you know, a decade ago, but, but I think speaks to, to some of those broader issues that continue to, 
really gain currency in, in Georgian uh, you know, public discourse about, about Stalin, uh, the Georgian nation building project, um, and, and uh, related, related issues. And, and Stalin, needless to say, is instr instrumentalized in all kinds of uh, strange and, and creative ways by pretty much you know, every uh, aspect of the Georgian political spectrum. Uh, so with that, I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Claire. And a reminder to our audience, uh, our virtual audience, if you have a question, please submit it via email to Kennan at wilsoncenter.org, by our Twitter at Kennan Institute, or on our Facebook page. At any time, please include your name and affiliation. So I'm going to start with this notion that somehow the Soviet Union managed ethnic diversity. Um, did they really manage it? Or did they kind of put it under the rug only for it to reemerge in its most virulent form after the collapse of the Soviet Union? So to what extent were the Soviet policies managing this form of ethnic diversity? Or to what extent was it simply covering it up uh, only to have it reemerge in the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union? Um. Very important question, uh, and I think this is uh, kind of getting at the the whole point behind why the Soviet Union devoted so many, you know, resources, human and otherwise, to this nation-building effort. Um, you know, there was an ideological reason behind it, right? It wasn't just nation-building for nation-building's sake. Uh, they had other things that they probably could have um, focused on instead of that. But, but really, from the get-go, from 1923. Um, Stalin and, and Lenin and other theorists understood that in order for the Soviet Union to one day make the grand happy leap to communism, uh, they had to overcome this, this national problem. Uh, it was viewed in developmental terms uh, because they were good Marxists, um, though Marx did not give them the answer to the national question, which is why Stalin, uh, you know, with Lenin's, I think, encouragement, decided to, to give his own, uh, you know, hand at it in his 1913 uh, treatise on the subject. Um, so, uh, again, this was not ethnophilia for fun, uh, to kind of use uh, Yuri Slowskin's term, which I think ethnophilia is, is a great way to describe the, the 20s and early 30s in terms of nationality policy. Um, but it was, you know, investing in the development of these different nationalities so that they could speed along the process of ultimately overcoming those. Of course, in retrospect, this seems, um, you know, like one of the great ironies in history that they were kind of sowing the seeds of their own destruction. <laughs> but, but I do think that um, describing it as a process that was, you know, maybe uh, uncovering, um, you know, national divisions from the start or something like that ignores the enormous amount of work that actually took place in that 70 years in the case of Georgia, 74 years in the case of some of the other um, uh, Soviet republics. You know, it, it, this, this period of national development and this sheer, you know, enormity of resources devoted to the effort did have an impact um, in creating these kind of, you know, nation states in embryo. And so it allowed the Soviet Union then, of course, to collapse along the lines that, that Stalin and, and Lenin had very neatly created. <laughs> um, but, you know, that, of course, was not the intent. Uh, it was, yeah, perhaps the great irony. I'm sure Lenin would have been horrified had he learned what, what happened to, to the, um, the national element, not to mention everything else. So from your perspective, was Stalin a Soviet nationalist or a Russian nationalist? So Stalin, um, let's see, he, this is, this is a very challenging question. Um, he was an anti-imperialist. Again, that, the, the facts seem to be a bit different there, but, but in terms of why they, they got started and, and constructing the whole thing to begin with, um, it was explicitly to be you know, anti-imperial because World War I was started right because of the entanglements of capitalism and imperialism. So um, I think uh, Stalin understood that there was a, you know, an ideological problem that need, needed to be dealt with uh, in terms of uh, grappling with nationality and ethnic diversity in the polity that would become the Soviet Union. Um, I think a, a sort of, not ethnic Russian, but Russian as internationalism, you know, certainly he did, he did promote that, um, especially, uh, you know, once he, he sort of embraced the, the Bolshevik cause. Um, but I think, uh, he, in, in particular looking at, at how he was understanding the, the landscape of the Caucasus, especially in the, the 20s and 30s, 
Um, you know, he had, and he wasn't alone, I think, Sergor Janikidze had, had many of the same sentiments, and they differed with Lenin on this. Um, you know, they, they were concerned about great power chauvinism in the Caucasus, not Russian chauvinism. <laughs> and so, you know, they were uh, in particular concerned about uh, Georgians and Armenians having too much power um, relative to, to other, um, you know, smaller nationalities in the space. And that was one reason why, you know, not only do we get the, the complicated anti-territorial map that we get um, in the Caucasus, but also this is one of the kind of defining policy disputes of, the, of Lenin's final days. Uh, the, the Georgian affair of 1922 and the, the last testament, so to speak, uh, of which there's, of course, lots of debates surrounding it. But issues about Georgian politics and, you know, concessions to Georgian nationalists, et cetera, are kind of at the, the heart of that and, and issues that Stalin felt, uh, you know, Intimately close to, shall we say. I'll open up for questions. Uh, I have one more question just to ask. And it's a very interesting part of your book in the sense that even after the secret speech, even after Stalin is long buried, or not buried, as the case may be, <laughs> um, Stalin still protects, as it were, mm -hmm. Georgia. So how does, how does the cult of Stalin and everything that he stood for still protect Georgia so many years after uh, the denunciation of Stalin? So I think this is a, a question that, um, you know, has a lot of different answers uh, and, and hits precisely at why historians look at change over time. Uh, because the, the Stalin cult in Georgia was not something that was as consistent maybe as it was as propagated from, through, from Moscow in his lifetime. But because of these, these demonstrations, because of the violent crackdown, and because it was something that Again, from a Moscow perspective, they absolutely did not want to happen again, <laughs> um, you know, in, in Tbilisi or anywhere. Um, it meant that the process of destalinization was not implemented consistently or evenly or really at all. Um, they had, over the course of, of 1956, uh, a series of basically listening sessions and parties to try to, you know, work through with, you know, criticism and self-criticism, uh, you know, uh, why, why Khrushchev made this policy change, et cetera, but um, those, those discussions often got kind of out of hand and, and turned more into, you know, why is uh, Khrushchev trying to denigrate Georgians, et cetera. Um, but uh, I don't think that that did a whole lot to move forward the, the policy of destalinization uh, locally. Uh, and then from 1956, you know, really until the 80s, you see this much more hands-off policy between Moscow and Tbilisi where as long as what happened in March 1956 didn't happen again. They were kind of left at their own devices in most cases. And so again, uh, Stalin is not really um, erased from the scene in a way, uh, in the way that he was, you know, perhaps elsewhere in a more concerted fashion. Um, it was uneven, uh, but I think much of the blame for the excesses of Stalin was re really went to Beria instead of him. Uh, and it meant then that uh, I think in the post-Soviet period, uh, subsequent generations of Georgians have had different ways of engaging with Stalin as a national hero. Um, you know, some of it is, uh, you know, I think a similar sense of Soviet nostalgia that you might see from from other, you know, kind of elderly groups who long for the the, the, the glorious 70s uh, uh, or that sort of thing when, when living standards were good and, and when there was peace, et cetera, uh, and, and when, you know, a different kind of Stalin cult was was alive and well. Um, you know, for others, I think, uh, particularly in younger generations, you know, it's, it's sort of using Stalin as uh, a point of, of national pride as well as a way to push back a little bit at, at um, you know, what maybe a, a more rural, less educated group might see as uh, a more westernizing Tbilisi elite, and that's their, their reaction to it. So, again, it's, uh, he takes many forms, but, but it's still very much uh, present. We'll take questions uh, in the room and online if uh, if they're if you ask them. But Michael, start from there. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to reading your book. Um, sort of two questions: Did did the Georgians have a particular niche in Soviet political and social life, economic and social life? And then, sort of related to that, flipping it the other way, your assessment of the role of Shevardnadze in the development of U.S.-Russian relations after the collapse of the Soviet Union. All right, so uh, Georgians and their, their sort of eco, eco, economic and social niche in the USSR. A um, few different elements here. I mentioned Georgia as the capital of the Soviet second economy in the 50s and, 60s and 70s. Um, you know, I think uh, 
there were lots of candidates maybe for that that crown, <laughs> but but Georgia definitely had it at that point. But I think in general, uh, Georgia was known for for a few things in which it kind of punched above its weight, so to speak. You know, small territory, small population, but they had the luxury goods, um, wine, citrus, tea, tobacco, etc., that were highly desired throughout the Soviet Union and I think the the broader kind of socialist world. Um, so they they had the the, the the luxury niche market, so to speak. Uh, they also had the the Soviet Riviera, um, the Black Sea coast, and so Soviet elite, you know, had their their dachas there. Stalin decamped with his um, uh, his aides there, you know, for pretty big stretches of the year. <laughs> so even if he wasn't getting back to Tbilisi, he was spending a lot of time in in Abkhazia, um, on the Black Sea coast, and I think for you know any workers who were getting those highly prized uh, vacations uh, as, as part of their, um, you know, their, their achievements, et cetera. Georgia and the, the Black Sea Coast was one of the most desirable destinations as far as, you know, um, leisure and, and hospitality went. Uh, and then uh, Georgian food, uh, dance, and, and music, as well as film, I think all had uh, enormous symbolic val value within the Soviet Union and, and for export. Uh, this is something that Eric Scott has written a wonderful book about I um, mean, covers a lot of those different, um, you know, me modes of cultural production. But I think each of those were were highly prized, um, you know, as kind of soft diplomacy tools by the Soviet Union, but a way also for to put Georgia on the map, um, both in the kind of classical canon uh, of I don't know uh, piano or that sort of thing, uh, avant-garde film, et cetera. And so uh, that was, uh, I think. Um, you know, another way to sort of showcase Georgianness and, and the nation building project for external audiences, including in the US. Um, Shevard Nadze, uh, he is one of the most fascinating figures that uh, I had to spend a lot of time with for my book. Um, you know, he ran Soviet Georgia from 1972 to 1985, uh, which is a period, um, I mean, he's had a fascinating life, um, you know, full stop. But I think those early years are something that we in the U.S. haven't focused as much on because his period as Soviet foreign minister as, um, you know, subsequent leader of Georgia, of course, dominate our, our attention. Um, so, uh, you know, I really, for me, that was one of the more interesting aspects of the book was getting to kind of meet young Shevardnadze and, and see just how much of a, you know, uh, gifted politician he was from those, those early years uh, and seeing how he managed the Tbilisi-Moscow relationship. Um, you know, in terms of him, uh, becoming an important interlocutor for, for relations with the United States in the, in the 90s. Um, I think it's clear uh, that, you know, number one, he understood the, the challenges that, uh, you know, the, the young state would face uh, and really, you know, used um, personal connections to, to his benefit there. And in particular, his relationship, very, very close relationship with Jim Baker. Uh, and so uh, I think that that allowed the relationship to to kind of get off on a, on a positive foot because they just you know had that that personal connection that that you know really I think it was it was such a chaotic time uh, for for everyone not to mention for for Shepard Nadze and for Georgia generally um, but but that proved to be an enormously uh, decisive and important relationship uh, going forward. Um, and I think, you know, Shevardnadze also, uh, of course, was, was ousted in 2003 as part of the Rose Revolution. Um, and he went, you know, went quietly uh, thereafter. He died in 2008, I believe. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, just seeing that, that sort of peaceful, uh, if, um, you know, grassroots transfer of power uh, was another important moment in the, in the U.S.-Georgia relationship that he had a hand in. Okay. Right here. We'll bring the microphone. Thank you very much. My name is Nadek Seferian. I recently defended my dissertation at Virginia Tech School of Public and International Affairs. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I was curious about one detail, which you touched upon a moment ago, about Stalin's movements. I know he had his dacha in, in Abkhazia, but I was wondering how often he visited various parts of the USSR and if he spent time in Georgia more than other places or how his you talk about his micromanaging things like textbooks or films and, and so on, but how the Georgianness might have also um, been reflected that way, perhaps during his time in power. Thank you. That's a, a great question. Um, he did not spend very much time in Georgia. Once he, you know, ascended to power in Moscow, um, he spent a lot of time in Abkhazia, which yes was part of the Georgian SSR, but he wasn't going to Tbilisi. Uh, his mother lived in Tbilisi, you know, uh, for the duration. She died in nineteen. 30, 
she died in 1937, 1937-35, I'm blanking on that, it's in the book, um, and is, uh, you know, so he would write letters to his mother, he would send his children there, you know, for vacation in the summers and that sort of thing. Um, Beria was often tasked with making sure that, you know, everyone was taken care of because he was running Georgia at that time. Um, but, but Stalin himself was not spending time, you know, on the, the, ter the non-Abkhaz territory of the Georgian SSR, which is, which is interesting. Um, you know, he, uh, and for what it's worth, uh, Stalin's mother is still buried in the uh, sort of Georgian pantheon um, next to, you know, the, the fathers of the nation and that sort of thing, which is just pretty bizarre, if you ask me. Um, you know, in general, my understanding of Stalin's sort of travels is, is he, he traveled by rail and he didn't really, I mean, he didn't leave the country. Um, so, you know, we have, with the ex a couple of important uh, exceptions, like Tehran, right? Um, but, but for the most part, right, he's not um, doing this sort of uh, statesman role uh, where he's traveling abroad a lot. Again, you know, it was a different time, but, uh, you know, within the Soviet Union uh, is not spending a whole lot of time in Georgia proper. Um, but does travel with an entourage at the same time when he does go somewhere. Jan, and then here. We're, 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 we're going to get a microphone to you, Jan. Oh, yes. Could you compare for us how Stalin treated Georgia vis-a-vis -vis the other Caucasus republics? Uh, what patterns developed vis-a-vis -vis Azerbaijan, vis-a-vis -vis Armenia versus those uh, in Georgia? So he had a, was born in Georgia, uh, but was not confined to Georgia, I think, in his understanding of the Caucasus more broadly. Um, he actually spent several, uh, several years in Baku, um, you know, as an underground revolutionary, and so I think had a decent understanding of, you know, the lay of the land there as well. Um, and then because of, uh, you know, imper the Imperial Caucasus, uh, Tbilisi was the, the capital of the Caucasus vice royalty, you know, it was a very multi-ethnic, multi-confessional place, you know, extremely significant Armenian populations, Russian populations, et cetera. So, you know, he is seeing the Caucasus, I think, in a bigger lens than the Georgian SSR, um, which, which is important. Uh, his, his, his network, uh, and I think maybe more accurately, Beria's network was one that was not limited to Georgia. They really constructed this as a pan-Caucasian um, power vertical, uh, with Beria really as the main like, implementer. Part of this was due to the fact that the Caucasus came into the Soviet Union as uh, uh, the Trans-Caucasus Federation. Um, and so it came in as a, as a, a single unit that still had um, you know, three constituent republics to it, but that meant that there were sort of you know, duplicate institutional structures uh, governing the thing. And, and Beria was the one running that. Um, for, for a good chunk of, of that period. So um, you have uh, party leaders coming to power in, in Armenia and in Azerbaijan that are part of that bigger barrier patronage network. Um, and that becomes important as well during the terror, et cetera, as well as um, you know, later on in the 40s. Um, and I think in general, looking at um, some of the you know, kind of pan pan union moments of you know, cultural production and things like that. I'm thinking of initiatives like the the Dekadi, uh, where um, you know each each republic or each nationality kind of gets a week to showcase their their art and their culture, etc. Um, Isabel Kaplan has has written a really interesting dissertation on this. But you know, I think there was an awareness that uh, Stalin and his his group, uh, which included you know Beria, Anastas Mikoyan. Um, and, and others, um, even Kirov for a time, you know, these were people who, you know, some of them were Caucasians themselves, some of them had honed their careers in the Caucasus, and so just had uh, a high level of familiarity with the landscape there and the, the peoples and the cultures, et cetera. And so they brought that familiarity with them, you know, even when they were making uh, kind of non-nationally specific, you know, decisions and policies. And so that level of intimacy was different than maybe what you know, they may have looked at with regard to, to Central Asia or, you know, Ukraine, for example. There was another hand right there. Thank you. Um, my name is Alec McRae. Um, my question is, clearly, during his years as national leader of the Soviet Union of Soviet Republics, Stalin retained a very strong interest in Georgia. But isn't it also true 
that when it came to appointing high-level leaders for the national government, that Stalin preferred ethnic Russians to Georgians or any other ethnic minority. Uh, in Georgia, and I think this does set Georgia apart from other um, national republics, Georgia had ethnic Georgian leadership the entire 70 years. That is different from Ukraine, that is different from Kazakhstan, uh, I think it's even different from Armenia, but Georgia consistently had Georgian leadership. Um, for a time, they, they tried to make a sort of token Russian second secretary work, but it was never really viewed as a, a real power player. Um, and so uh, part of that, I think, is uh, due to the peculiarities of how Georgia came into the Soviet Union to begin with and the, so to speak, concessions that they needed to make to, to old Bolsheviks, so to speak, in, in Georgia in order to make that work. But, um, you know, part of that is due to the Georgianness of the uh, kind of patronage network that, that Stalin and Beria constructed in that period. I think maybe you misunderstood my question. What I meant was when, he came, when it came to appointing uh, top leaders to the national Soviet government, that Stalin preferred ethnic Russians to other minority groups. I don't know that, I mean... I don't know that he was that uh, intentional about it, but he had a number of, of Georgians and other people from the Caucasus who were you know, leading the security services, leading the uh, Ministry of Heavy, Heavy Industry and Trade, et cetera. Um, so you know, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag, but I think publicly he was projecting an issue, uh, a, um, an identity and, and an image of you know, Soviet, uh, Russianized Sovietness. Um, if that makes sense. We have a question uh, from Tom Simons, and he asked, without the extremism of the Zviad regime riding the Georgian dominance, uh, ridding the Georgian dominance uh, the Soviet regime had nurtured, would the Abkhaz issue have come to a crisis? Uh, well, I think the, the Abkhaz uh, issue, whatever we want to call it, um, you know, was well on its way to, to reaching a boiling point before Zviad was even, you know, really part of the, the political conversation. Um, uh, Zviad Gamsakhordia, this is the, the first per president of Georgia, but kind of long time well known if um, not very popular Georgian dissident. Um, you know, he was, his, his father was the, um, a, a prominent uh, kind of Stalin era uh, Georgian writer, um, and so he had a prominent family and, and uh, well-recognized name and, and kind of use that to, to his benefit, I suppose. But, um, but he really had very little following in the Soviet period until these demonstrations in 1989 uh, turned violent very, very quickly. So this uh, April 9th, 1989 uh, is, is a, I think, a key moment for um, contemporary Georgian national identity and really when the Georgian Soviet experiment, you know, died. It died very suddenly uh, when, when Soviet troops uh, killed a few dozen Georgians uh, you know, on the, the steps of the parliament uh, in response to these, these uh, demonstrations against what was happening in Abkhazia. But the, the Abkhazia uh, issue or challenge is something that really had been brewing at least since the 40s. Uh, and so every 10 years or so, uh, groups of Abkhaz mobilized, uh, demanding greater, uh, greater rights or um, you know, Acknowledgement of, of some grievances from Tbilisi uh, would would try to, to get Moscow to intervene. Moscow wouldn't. Things would you know calm down a little bit because there would be some sort of, of compromise or concession, but it would just paper over the problem basically. So every ten years, starting from the late 40s to 1989, you had increasing demands from Abkhaz, which you know ranged from uh, you know educational, economic, etc., kind of cultural rights to then calling to be transferred to the RSFSR to then calling to be independent. Uh, and of course, uh, that was uh, several bridges too far for, for Georgians by that point. Um, so of course, um, Gamsakhordia and his followers, um, once they were kind of propelled into, into decision-making uh, positions uh, from you know, 1989 onward, uh, capitalized on that situation, I would say. Uh, but there was a, a pretty long history of, of tension there um, that had been escalating over the course of you know, a good half century. Any questions? Right here. 
my name is David Luria, but my question is, how is Stalin uh, presented today in Georgia on the governmental level, and how do people perceive him as a more or less a popular hero still today? So unlike Russia, where you know Putin clearly has embraced Stalin as you know uh, a figure to be revered, <laughs> that has not happened in Georgia. The government is not embracing Stalin as a national hero by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I think uh, really they're not talking about him at all. <laughs> um, they they they're they're focusing their efforts on other things. But Stalin is very much a topic of conversation uh, among a few different groups, public historians. Um, including a number of you know, civil society groups, intellectuals, that sort of thing, who are trying to improve the public's awareness of uh, the Stalinist period in Georgian history, repressions, the extent of, you know, of violence and, and, and trauma, et cetera, um, you know, doing tours of Tbilisi uh, for kind of, you know, uh, I think... Uh, the, the topography of terror, I think is what they call it, you know, some of uh, just so that people have a better understanding of the, the extremes and, and uh, trauma of Stalinism such that they don't maybe want to revere him as a national hero. Um, so that's happening, I think, kind of in the, the realm of public history and civil society. Um, I mentioned this, this effort uh, emanating from the central government in, in 2010 uh, where they adopted something called the Freedom Charter and that outlawed Soviet symbols and Nazi symbols because they just kind of copied it from the Baltics um, in public spaces. And so that's when you see you know, the, the stars and the hammers and sickles, et cetera, being stripped from all government buildings in, in Georgia. And that you know, was largely c carried out. Again, this was under President Saakashvili. Um, but that didn't, uh, of course, apply to private property. And so every few years you'll see a new article um, in the Georgian press of, you know, oh, a Stalin statue has been erected in, you know, insert village here. Um, it's usually on private property, and that's still legal, and so it happens. Um, and so uh, with each sort of new Stalin statue that gets erected, um, of course, then there's concern from the aforementioned civil society groups that, that view that as a negative phenomenon. Uh, and I think, um, again, Georgia has an enormously polarized political environment uh, today, but really has for the past you know, several years. And so I think Stalin is an easy, I don't know, boogeyman, so to speak, uh, to, um, to bring into the political conversation, uh, to you know, refer to opponents as Stalinists or trying to you know, bring Stalin back into the fold, that sort of thing. But, but it's more grassroots. It isn't, you know, something that's that's an officially propagated position the way that it would be in Russia. So, Putin often says that um, Lenin planted a time bomb under the Soviet Union because he decided to adapt the nationalist policies and built the Soviet Union on the nationalist policies. Has he made some sort of criticism towards Stalin about that? Because Stalin had a very important role as well. Um, it's a good question. And looking back at, you know, I'm thinking of Putin's speech last year on the eve of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Um, he says a lot of very bad things about Lenin, places the blame really at Lenin's feet. But, but yeah, Stalin is not, not really in the mix as much. And he probably should be, <laughs> um, given his role, you know, not only as theorist of um, uh, Bolshevik nationality policy, but as the early implementer of it, as, as commissar, uh, commissar of nationalities. So, um, you know, that's some convenient uh, rewriting of history on Putin's part, but of course he's taken many other liberties as well Indeed. in that regard. Um, uh, and I think... Um, <clears throat> You know, the, the, the image of Stalin that's being promoted by Putin, uh, and again, you know, over the past decade or more, is a very different image of Stalin than what one might see, again, kind of in more of a, a grassroots or individual fashion in Georgia, where, you know, it's, it's much more tied to the fact that, well, he, he was a Georgian and is the most famous Georgian, therefore, you know, there's some element of pride there, you know, in spite of the, the horrors of Stalinism and, and uh, what, what actually... Uh, life under Stalin entailed. I think the, the sort of calculus in, in, in Russia is rather different. It's not emphasizing his Georgianness at all, quite the contrary. <laughs> it's emphasizing his sort of um, pan-national and, and russified 
sort of image and uh, ultimately, and again, this is something we've really seen in the, the narrative over the past year, the defeater of fascism. And so it's that great power image of Stalin, not you know, one that has any sort of national dimension. So one last question about the issue of Georgian national identity. Um, have we seen a transition over the past week or two? <laughs> I mean, has the idea that somehow Georgians would protest the foreign agents law that was clearly a part or linked to the Russian Federation and instead embraced what has long been the aspiration of Georgia to be a more European country and to be a part of Europe. Um, have we reached a turning point uh, over the last few, few weeks or is what you've talked about still ongoing? So I think, uh, I mean, the past few weeks have been fascinating to watch, and we're very much, I think, still in the middle of it. Um, the, the immediate crisis was resolved, but I, I think it's uh, something will, will come up again, you know, certainly between now and when the next parliamentary elections are scheduled, which will be in uh, I think probably October of 2024. That seems like an eternity from now. Um, but I think, uh, on the one hand, it speaks to the, the extremely polarized political environment in Georgia. But even with that, uh, Georgians, uh, if you look at polls from pretty much any group, um, regardless of whether they're you know, American, European, or, or uh, domestic in Georgia, the overwhelming majority of, of people want to move you know, closer to Euro-Atlantic integration, aspire to membership in the EU and or NATO, though the reason for um, aspiring to that membership is, is highly based on uh, an assumption that that will improve their economic well-being. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think the, the events of, of this month uh, do feel like uh, the, the tide is shifting a bit um, because, again, putting a Band-Aid over the problem is not going to, to solve anything. And uh, people's willingness to um, speak out and, and uh, do so really um, with, with great force, um, you know, pr proved itself. And it showed the extent to which uh, Georgia's Euro-Atlantic partners, US, EU, et cetera, are willing to, to weigh in on these. But I think the story is far from over. Uh, and uh, do think that, you know, watching the, the events, the March 9th dates lining up, you know, almost perfectly, though uh, thankfully with, with not quite the, the tragic end that it saw in 1956, um, you know, was very eerie a couple of weeks ago. Um, did not expect or, you know, want the book to kind of be timely in that regard, but, but here we are. Well, thank you so much, Claire, for a fascinating talk. I'm going to now hold up the book, because I did not do that initially. <laughs> but it is Georgian and Soviet, entitled Nationhood and the Specter of Stalin in the Caucasus. And it's a very important read about what's going on both historically and, obviously, current developments as well. So thank you very much, Claire. Um, as I said earlier, there is a discount code that I'm going to read one more time. It is 09BCARD, and that can gives you, give you a 30% discount uh, on the Cornell University Press website. So thanks so much, Claire, and thank you all for coming. Yep. Thanks, everyone.